Hey, I'm selling my Mac Mini. The idea of the M1 Mac Mini was a beautiful idea and still is. Taking the power of the M1 chip, the first ever Apple Silicon chip, and putting that into a Mac Mini and having it perform the way that it did. Being able to edit 4K video on Final Cut Pro, being able to work on huge Logic Pro projects, and being able to really use the Adobe Suite on the M1 Mac Mini was just something that I don't think any of us ever thought that we could do on a machine like the Mac Mini. The Mac Mini for a while had turned into a machine that was just used for servers or for very, very basic computing. Something that you just kind of had in the background and it just kind of did its thing, but was never your primary machine. So then for me, it was a huge test to see if I could make the Mac Mini, the M1 Mac Mini, my permanent main desktop computer after I had the 2014 5K Retina iMac, the 27 inch. I was on that computer for a very, very long time. And then when I saw the promise of the M1 chips, I knew that I wanted a desktop solution. So the MacBook Pro 13 inch and the MacBook Air 13 inch were out of the question. The Mac mini was the machine that I gravitated towards. And for the price that I paid for it, it was easily the least expensive Mac computer purchase laptop or desktop that I had ever made. And the idea that that amount of money could last me possibly six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years was something that I was very intrigued by. But I'm making this video because I've come to the conclusion that the M1 Mac mini, as much as I love it, and as much as I adore the machine and how solid it has been, is just not powerful enough for what I wanted to do. And so I'm therefore moving on from the M1 Mac Mini. So when I first got the M1, I didn't really know what to expect, but let me tell you, uh, after some troubleshooting of trying to get it to work with my Apple Thunderbolt display, which I made an entire video for, and I'll link it in the description down below, I finally got it to work and it worked exactly how I thought it would, and then some. It outperformed everything that I had in the past. It definitely blew away my 2014 iMac Retina. There's no question about that. I was scrubbing through 4K timelines and Final Cut like it was nothing. I was playing back old Logic projects like it was, like it was nothing. Like it was like the most, I like I was just playing an MP3 from iTunes. But what I didn't account for was that when I transferred over the majority of the plugins that I was using, primarily in audio production from my iMac to the M1, a good number of them didn't port over. I had old contact plugins and old mastering plugins that didn't transfer over. So I was finding uh, workarounds uh, to supplement them until I finally got around to purchasing contact again. So when I made my initial video praising the M1 Mac Mini, particularly in the audio production department, I failed to note that I had not still tried out the old plugins that I did before. I finally got around to purchasing contact. I finally got around to downloading all my old sounds and some additional ones, and then using Logic the way that I used to with the 5K Retina iMac. And I came to a problem. The problem was that no matter if I had the buffering size on 128, 256, 512, or even 1024, the M1 Mac Mini could not play back the project, not for the full length of the song. It would play 30 seconds and then abruptly stopped. It would play 20 seconds and then abruptly stopped. It became something that I quite quickly realized I could not do if I wanted to do audio production. It just wasn't going to work the way that I wanted it to work. Now, I coincidentally have purchased also the M1 Max MacBook Pro, the 16 inch and with the 24 core GPU. I purchased that machine because I saw the promise of the 24 cores and getting 32 gigabytes of unified memory as opposed to the 16 gigabytes that you're capped at with the Mac mini. I got it because I thought, hey, this would be a great portable solution. I could take it with me on trips now that everything's opening up again. I could take with me in the backyard or in the bedroom or in the living room, wherever I want to work or edit or just do anything. Why wouldn't I want to have this amazing, powerful machine with me that can do all these things, which by the way, the fan has never turned on once and the battery life is absolutely amazing. Why not? So the idea was that the M1 Mac mini was going to be my permanent desktop computer. And then I would have the M1 Max MacBook Pro as my portable solution. I could airdrop files back and forth. And then I could basically use iCloud for smaller files to transfer back and forth, or just, you know, figure out a way where I could have the best of both worlds. But once the M1 Mac mini became my permanent desktop solution for audio and I got back into it, that's where I started noticing 
the limitations of the M1 Mac Mini. I purchased Contact and the, the associated plugins with it, and quickly I realized that the M1 Mac Mini was not going to hack it. So I took the identical project from the M1 Mac Mini and put it on the M1 Max MacBook Pro, made sure that I had the identical plugins and everything was ready to go, and it worked beautifully. It didn't blip at all, not even a single stop at 1024 or 512 or 256 for that matter. I had to make that hard decision of, hey, maybe the M1 Mac mini is not going to be the machine for what I wanted to do. Now, if I had an additional room in my home or in my studio, yes, the M1 Mac mini would be a fantastic secondary computer. It would be amazing to have as a second edit bay or just a great computer for word processing or internet browsing or anything like that if we had the space in the house. Unfortunately, we don't have the space and what you see is my work area. I only have the one station and I'm only one person, so I don't necessarily need two computers. And to be frank, I haven't had a laptop as my permanent you know, main computer for a very, very long time, for over a decade. I've had the 2010 iMac 27 inch, I had the 2014 iMac Retina 5K, and now I've had the Mac Mini. But I cannot emphasize enough how much I think the M1 Mac Mini is a fantastic, fantastic computer. For 99% of the population out there, if you want a sleek and powerful desktop computer that has all the ports that you could possibly need from USB-A to USB-C, HDMI, audio jack, etc., then the M1 Mac Mini, I think, is the way to go. If you already have a monitor, if you already have a keyboard and a mouse, then a $600 or $700 investment is not a lot considering that you get into the Apple ecosystem and that you get all the benefits of it at that price point. You know, I'm really curious what they're gonna be doing with the Mac Mini in the future, like if they're going to be updating it with the supposed uh, rumored M2 chip, and if they're going to uh, increase the limitation of the unified memory, maybe to uh, you know 32 gigabytes of unified memory, or maybe even like, let's say 24. But would that cannibalize the market for the Mac Studio? If anything, this experiment has taught me that you can do a lot with Apple's lowest priced computing system. You can do a lot with the Mac Mini. You can do a lot with the regular iPad. Not even the iPad Pro or the iPad Air or the iPad Mini, like with the regular iPad. You can do a lot with the iPhone SE. I know we really fixate on the latest and greatest that Apple has to offer, whether it's the Mac Studio, whether it's a Mac Pro, whether it's an iMac Pro back in the day, um, whether it's you know the, the new M1 Max is MacBook Pros that you know that I have that I bought into the hype of that because I thought this is going to be something that I will use on an everyday basis and so far that has been the case. But if anything, using the Mac Mini has shown me that you can definitely get away with the base price stuff that Apple provides and you can do a lot with it. Specifically, if you're a content creator, a video professional, or anything like that, you can do a lot with the M1 Mac Mini. Are there limitations? Absolutely. Yes, there are. I think every computer is going to have limitations. It depends on what you pay for, right? And if you are buying an M1 Ultra starting at $4,000, obviously you'll be able to do more than buying an M1 Mac Mini with just the M1 chip. That's obvious. There's no question about that. But I think for me, as I've, I've delved into the world of the M1s, I've tried the Mac Mini, I've now tried the M1 Max MacBook Pro, and I'm now getting the studio display to pair with my M1 Max MacBook Pro. I think it... Uh, for me, I have figured out what my sweet spot is. And for me, it's the 24 core GPU M1 Max MacBook Pro, 32 gigabytes of memory, and the one terabyte hard drive. I think that for me is is, is the perfect spec out laptop that I have, the perfect spec out machine that I have. It does a little bit more than I need it to do. And so that's the reason why I am moving on from the M1 Mac mini. It pains me to say it because I absolutely love the machine, but it is truly time for me to move on. What do you think about the M1 Mac Mini? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you wanna watch the video where I get my Mac Mini and I'm having trouble with it right out of the box, then I'll uh, put the link for that video down below. Thank you so much for watching. Consider liking this video if you did like it and consider subscribing as I'm trying to get to a thousand. I would greatly appreciate your support. More videos coming soon. My name is Amir and I'll see you next time.